Hello, everybody. Can you all hear me? Great. Thank you for being here tonight. I'm Sarah Newman. I'm the James Dickey Curator at the Smithsonian American Art Museum of Contemporary Art. And I'm happy to welcome you tonight to our Artist Roundtable, featuring Taiwa Go, Jiha Moon, Nara Park, and Ha Young Yoon. This is an event we've been looking forward to for quite a while, and we're co-presenting it with the Korean Cultural Center here in DC, so thank you to the KCC. Just a bit of business before we get started. First, um, I'd like to ask you to silence your cell phones. Um, also, toward the end of the program, we'll have time for questions from the audience. Uh, and if you would like to ask a question, uh, we will ask you to uh, come to the sides, to the aisles, and speak into a microphone. We'll be webcasting this program tonight, so um, our online audience won't be able to hear you if you're not speaking into the microphone. Um, some of you may have received a survey when you came in. The Korea Foundation, one of the sponsors of our exhibition, Almost Home, is interested to know more about how our audience engages with our programs. So um, if you're so inclined, please fill that in. And finally, once the program ends, we'd love to invite you to a reception in the lobby um, just outside and just afterwards uh, with the artists and with refreshments. So please join us for that. And now to the reason we're here. We have invited this diverse and terrific group of artists to speak on the occasion of our exhibition, Almost Home, by Dio Hossa, which I hope you've all had the chance to see uh, or will see by the, by the time it leaves us in early August. At its root, Dio Hossa's art probes what it means to exist between and among cultures. Born in Korea in 1962, he came to the United States when he was, when he was 29, and lived here for decades until he met and married his British wife, started a young family, and now currently lives between London and New York and Seoul. His work is about that state of belonging to many places and to no place at once, and his search for identity and meaning within that state of transience. His reconstructed homes and household objects made out of diaphanous fabric provide a portal into his personal memories and his lived experience. Doho says art operates on several levels at once. The first is completely and intensely personal, even intimate. The work is quite literally a catalog of the spaces from his various homes and, and their nooks and crannies, an invitation uh, to come into his home. On an, another level in which the art operates is broad and universal. Everyone has had the experience of leaving a childhood home, of feeling like an outsider, and of trying to reconstruct a past. And it's in this way that a lot of people um, connect with the work. But there's another way that the work can be understood as well, <clears throat> in a mode perhaps somewhere on the spectrum between the previous two that I've just described. And that is to understand it at the level of culture how artists immersed in one culture absorb and reject and synthesize another. So that's what we wanted to explore tonight, the notion of transnationalism and cultural exchange in a specifically Korean-American context. The artists that we've gathered for this conversation are all originally from Korea but now live in the U.S. and they've all spent uh, a good amount of time in the D.C. Baltimore area and so many of you have probably had a chance to see some of their work in person. They're incredibly varied in approach and materials, encompassing painting, sculpture, drawing, printmaking, performance, installation, and video. And their work ranges from cool, minimal abstraction to over-the-top Baroque fantasy. Presented with such diversity, how can we begin to think about art in relation to transnationalism? In some instances, these artists consciously explore an idea of hybridized identity. But in other work, the majority really, uh, it doesn't really come up directly. So how might the exchange between cultures enter the work or provide a backdrop for it? And th is this even a useful framework at all to think about the art? Each artist will of course have different answers for this. And I know you're all eager to hear from them, so that is what we'll do. 
They'll each come up and speak uh, for a bit about their work, and then we'll have a discussion between us, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. The first artist that we're going to hear from is Taiwa Go. Taiwa Go was born in Seoul, Korea, where she uh, lived through college. She works in the intersection of printmaking and sculpture, pushing the boundaries of traditional printmaking from two-dimensional images on paper to 3D installations that transform space. She's had solo installations at Wave Hill and Brick and has shown her work at the International Print Center in New York, the Dumbo Art Festival, and the Islip Museum, among other institutions. And she's been given grants and honors by the National Endowment for the Arts, the Museum of Arts and Design Studio Program, Gutenberg Art, Vermont Studio Center, and the Korean Cultural Center. Thanks. Good evening. Uh, I'm Taiwa Go. I'm doing the pre installation. Uh, I'm trying to combine the pre making and installation together. Um, I always interested in the dynamic engagement with the viewer instead of showing my artwork in the framed two dimensional pre making images. So uh, I kind of pushing the boundary between sculpture and um, the pre-making, that's my focus, you know, the, uh, my recent work. In layering, folding, and uh, cutting prints, uh, I made it a site-specific installation, and then layering with bright colors and uh, some playful forms, and then incorporating some cement casting or uh, steel pipes and plastic tube. I want to invite the viewer to the you know nature and at the same time very industrial landscape, and uh, but it's not just the playful and um, uh, very joyous. Uh, also, it manages the viewer um, like a plopping or a bursting or um, the growing and decaying. And then many people ask me the you know process. So uh, first of all, I need a lot of sketches because you know I'm the site-specific installation artist. So you know I have to research the site a lot. So. I have to do really, you know, sketch a lot about the site, and then I come up the idea what I have to make. After that, I have to make the prints. So, uh, for making the, you know, small three-dimensional thing, at least I need 40 editions of the prints. So that's the reason I'm, you know, recently focusing on making silk screen print prints. And then that's the reason my daughter over there to help me. And um, I need the wax, the paper. I melt the wax, the paper, wax onto the paper for making the uh, paper stiff, for making three-dimensional things. Also, uh, it makes the uh, paper translucent. So when I make the three-dimensional thing, um, the paper um, has the both side image, so uh, I can make the three-dimensional thing easily. And then after that, I glue the you know prints together, making layers, or sometimes on the wall directly making the layers, and then those layers uh, kind of reflect to the accumulation of my memories and then experience, or uh, some multi layers of the, my identity, and then also those layers make the you know uh, extend the the architectural elements interesting and. Um, the site-specific installation. Uh, so I'm going to explain my uh, piece uh, project by project, and then most of the work I am showing here that happened in two years. So this one is the ebb and flow, and then um, it's the 2016 at William Patterson University. So ebb and flow uh, attempt to delineate the intersection between the inner and outer mass of the a human body. And then as you see, the gallery space is really interesting. So actually, I have the eight walls instead of four walls. So inside and outside of the gallery connect together. So I want to highlight the contrast between the space. So you know, the, I want to show the inward and outward the active, act, 
uh, activity of the human body um, as the uh, imaginary landscape. Oops, sorry. So um, while reflecting on experience loss and absent, I'm interested in the highlighting the contrast between the you know, fantasies, um, joyful tropical fantasies of landscape and vis-a-vis -vis a land of darkness of decay. And then walking in and out of the gallery, viewer feels the you know, tension between the contrast. So actually I missed the, um, yeah. That one is the outside of the gallery. So, and then this one is the inside of the gallery. And then this one is the detail. So you can see the screen printed images and then lots of layers. And then that's the pass one of the passageway of the gallery. So um, there are four corners like that. <coughs> and then you can see the lots of layers. And then um, it uh, reflects the accumulation of memories and my experience. Uh, and this one, um, the installation overflow that was happened uh, spring 2016 at Wave Hill. This is the sunroom project. So sunroom was used for as a sunroom because the uh, place Wave Hill is the uh, uh, botanical garden. And springtime to fall time, uh, that space was used for the site-specific installation space. So uh, for this project over here, I started with imagining what would happen if the container of nature collapsed or uh, what if the plant overwhelmed in this controlled uh, man-made interior space. So um, after installation, and um, this three-dimensional, you know, uh, the installation piece, people walk in or, you know, walk around it. And um, this is the detail shot. The, one of the inspiration for making this piece is the Lorex, the children's book by uh, Dr. Seuss. Um, the Lorex is the creature who speaks for trees that doesn't have tongue. So, you know, I tried to make the tongue for trees for this piece. So, you know, this red thing is kind of the, you know, tongue, uh, the for trees and the hanging from the, the green giant ball. And then it maybe, you know, speaks and screams to a human being. And then my uh, uh, installation extended to the wall also. So it makes the, you know, totally uh, environment and then uh, of the overgrowth, both botanical imagery and architectural form. Um, I choose color very joyous and tropical and bright, but at the same time, it's very artificial, candy-like neon fluorescent colors. Um, the reason, because uh, I want to um, make the, some tempting color, but also very poisonous and toxic and dangerous, that scream, that kind of reflect the metaphor as a scream of nature. And this piece is the installation uh, piece that is called the Leaks. It's the hallway public project. And then, because the hallway is very interesting, because it has uh, emotions that are hidden behind the door. I want to kind of the, uh, um, show that you know, emotions coming out from the, you know, some gap of the pipes or gap of the doors on the hallway. And, um, so my artwork was the open expression of those emotions that the constrained hallway struggled to contain. So. This is the detail shot, so you can see the, you know, some of uh, the texture screen printing images on it. And then this is the different version of the leaks. And uh, recently, I'm developing the DIY installation kit because I always want the you know very dynamic relationship with the viewer. So, but you know, the, even though I'm doing the installation, it's it has a restriction, and then people has to experience my pieces in certain way. So, I want make the you know DIY, and then people can really use my elements as they want. 
So if you see the you know, some piece inside of it, it has a three-dimensional pieces and two-dimensional pieces and three-dimensional pieces. You, if you want to make a totally three-dimensional, you can open totally or you can just uh, put on the wall too. So it has a fixture for the wall and then a uh, certificate and then also the instruction sheet. So <laughs> if uh, you find the place and then open it and if you don't know what to do, just call me. <laughs> and then after you installed, and then these are the you know different kits, and then it, oh, it was actually happened in baby room. <laughs> and then 2017, 2018, I'm developing another you know small series. It's, that is called a symmetrical floristry series. Uh, the, my childhood memory, uh, it makes me, you know, doing this, uh, starting this project because, you know, the, my mom used to do the floristry. And then that scene, the very strong scene inside the, my brain because my mom do the, did the uh, floristry because of, you know, a decorative reason, but not, not just that, but also, you know, as a meditation. So she uh, always sit a very certain way, very calmly, and then she used a very certain, you know, tools to cut the, you know, the flowers and then arrange the flowers. Very, very scary, many needles on it. You know, the very sharp needles, it's a flower frog. So that scary scene really incites to me and then later I, uh, kind of that makes me the research the you know sociological or psychological you know the background of the floristry and then recently I'm developing this and then this one is the uh, I combining the found object and then my organic small um, sculptural pieces together and then uh, it makes the you know, it makes the statement about the relationship between human and nature, human and plant, or human and human, how components are independent or inter interdependent on the, you know, domination. Also, it shows the, you know, multi-complex uh, of my identity, too. So this is the final um, the slide, and then because you know the, I found this one preparing this presentation, and then that was done 1996. It's 22 years ago. It's the right after I graduated my college. So um, I'm not that different, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, but you know, there is no difference, you know, at the time, right now, you know, I'm kind of the journey to find myself, you know, the only difference between this and this, this one is the called, uh, the title is the Thai's wardrobe. Uh, I have more clothes in my wardrobe and the more complex layers of, you know, um, wardrobe and then also, you know, very undistinguishable clothes too. So um, I'm still in the journey to find, you know, myself and then to, I'm trying to make sense of my identity. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's done um, the uh, Children's Museum of Manhattan recently, and then if you have uh, the chance to visit the New York, it's still up until December, and then uh, you know, upcoming events, you can go to the Taiwago.com. Thank you. Nara Park will be our next speaker. She is a sculptor and installation artist based here in Washington, DC. Her work investigates the landscape and the materials around us, probing illusion, desire, and the traces we leave behind. She holds a BFA as well as an MFA in sculpture from the Maryland Institute College of Art, where she received the Outstanding Student Achievement in Contemporary Sculpture Award. She's also received the Trawick Contemporary Art Award and a Hamiltonian Artist Fellowship. 
Park's work has been shown at many institutions, including at the Contemporary Art Center New Orleans, Grounds for Sculpture, BWI Airport, and the Kasson Center at American University. And it has been acquired by the Phillips Collection and the Samzi Art Collection in Seoul. Thank you everyone coming, for coming out tonight. Um, yeah, This is the first slide I'm going to show. In my work, I try to explore our relationship to the landscape we live in and the marks we leave on that world after we are gone. My ongoing inspiration comes from my father's death 11 years ago. <clears throat> it led me to question our relationship with this world and try to discover what exists beyond our superficial physical perceptions. So over the, few years, uh, over the past few years, I visited many cemeteries to see how we memorialize life in this physical space and ponder what really remains of all of us as time passes. So the mass-produced tombstones I saw taught me that graves are only manufactured objects. Indeed, what truly meaningful, what's truly meaningful about any life lived is too often invisible. The photo here on the left shows the Seoul National Cemetery in South Korea. And the photo on the right is the Black Hills National Cemetery in South, South Dakota in the US. So I have lived in both countries and so I look for the connection between my observations of the Korean and American cultures for my artistic inspiration. So since 2012, I have created a, a number of works with disposable boxes with a stone pattern. Packaging boxes are meant to suggest the idea of concealment, hiding what is inside, and thus seeing more clearly the disposable aspects of life. Indeed, our bodies also go into boxes after we die. So in my work, stone is a metaphor for strength, stability, and permanence. By choosing to use false materials, I am creating illusions that are meant to evoke society's sacred spaces, such as graves and shrines. It is my way of breathing an alternative life force into something that is not actually real. So in this particular installation, I, uh, visitors, visitors were invited to lie down inside the structure. And this is a um, view of the interior of the structure. Behind the wall of, wall of this vent, a humidifier is installed and the mist, mist it produces comes through the vent. And it keeps the space cold and humid and it causes the bo paper boxes to become soggy. And this is a different version of the previous piece. The configuration was inspired by ruins. And this is a piece where visitors can navigate through the maze. And this is an installation of a room that is covered with tiles made of wallpaper. Um, and it leads to another room the viewer cannot walk on the tiles to see the second room because the tiles are made of paper. And that room, however, radiates the light. And the viewer, visitors can only peek through the doorway from afar. So I installed fluorescent lights in the second room, which makes it really bright. Oh, and this is a different view. And uh, this picture shows the installation of a wishing well that is made out of only wallpaper with a slate texture. The well is filled with black sand at the bottom. The audience is invited to make a wish and throw a coin into the well. 
And by having the viewer make a wish in a fake wishing well, the piece engages the viewer to participate in a superstitious act. And that act suggests the vulnerability of all beliefs. And this piece is installed in a dark space with a spotlight in the middle. Hollow rocks made out of a wallpaper as well are gathered into a pile. And the idea of a pile of rocks came from burial markers that are used to commemorate the dead. This is the detail of the piece. And this is a waterfall made of plastic boxes and a water pump. And the flowing water is intended to remind us of the passage of time, which also constantly is in a moving state. Moving state. Any natural landscape made with man-made materials implies our limited understanding of this world, and suggests there is always more life that keeps on flowing. And these are some more works inspired by the natural, natural environment. And in 2016, my work became more focused on the imperfections of life. The greed in this work suggests a man-made order and perfection. And it is also broken into pieces. And every piece is hung with strings separate from each other. But as a whole, it looks like one panel. But you, if you see the shadows, you can see the fractures. And this piece comes from a series that explores my longing to accept the imperfections of life and embrace the beauty of all physical vulnerability. The piece is made of formica, and its fragments are connected with monofilament that allows the viewer to peer through the cracks. And the hollowness of this piece suggests there is always a void under the surface of any monolithic structure. These are some other versions. And when, oh, these are installation views. When my father was buried, I <clears throat> buried my letter to him with his body. And I believe he could read it if, if I left it physically with him. In the letter, I wrote my promises about the kind of life I was going to live. And I l later tried to recall what I wrote to see if I was actually keeping those promises. <clears throat> but I could, I could not remember them. I realized I shouldn't have buried the letter since it surely had decayed by now. Inspired by, <coughs> sorry, inspired by that realization, I made sty styrofoam panels engraved with, engraved with unreadable marks and coated with stone textured house paint. This is a detail. These are other uh, versions. Before constructing constructing this particular piece, I was I thought about what I want to remember right before I die. I thought about my childhood when my family was young and happy. Thus, white sand here suggests our body, which will become ashes. The sand castle suggests our memories, our childhoods, and our accomplishments. The ca camp lantern represents hope, guidance, and courage, so another person can continue our journey. This piece is one of my most recent ones. Um, I made photocopies of gallery guest books. In them, visitors can leave notes about how they felt about the shows they saw, and they can also write personal messages to the artist. And I photo transfer the, their words onto the gallery walls as though they had actually written their, written their comments as marks on the walls. This is the detail 
Um, this piece touches on the eternal question of what remains when the show is over. The notes remain to prove that the art that has uh, the notes prove, re, remain to prove that the art that was seen will continue living on in people's hearts forever. Thank you. Ha Young Yoon is originally from South Korea and is now based in New York. In her diverse and multifaceted practice, she explores systems of thought, perception, and sensation. She's shown widely in the US and internationally, including at the Bronx Museum of the Arts, the Delaware Center for Contemporary Art, the New Bedford Art Museum, and the Seoul Olympic Museum of Art in Korea, among others. She's received awards from Brick Media Arts, as well as the Franklin Furness Fund. She received, received her BFA from Hon, Honjik, is that how you say it? Honik, Honik University in Seoul in 2004, and her MFA from Cranbrook in 2009. Thank you. Hi, it's very nice to meet you all. I'm so honored to be here tonight. So I make human hair sculptures and combine them with video and performance. This is the first work for which I use the hair sheared from my head, then transform the hair into a sculpture. So it came back to my body with new symbolism, which represents invisible thought. In 2005, a year before I moved to the USA, I attended a retreat in South Korea. I was introduced to many different forms of practices, include, including the practice of fully inhabiting the present, clearing the mind, and recognizing our duality. So it was a moment that I uh, think about arts and life. So I was looking for a material that embodies or they can represent both body and mind. I think human hair is intimately corporeal, tactile, and focuses the viewer's attention on the body. So I make wearable hair sculpture and then like deliver that corporeal feeling. And also since the hair doesn't decay long after death, it is an appropriate symbol of rem remembrance because I tie hair lengths together piece by piece uh, into a structure that is mostly uh, air, my hair sculpture become transparent like invisible thoughts and memories. So in the video watching the mind, I let go of the sculpture representing the departure of my thoughts from my body through the meditative process. So this is, this is an excerpt from the video. I attended several artist residence programs, and I started to look to nature as a stage for my video. I constructed a white space in a field, and then I cut a hole in the ceiling, allowing natural light to come in from sunrise to sunset. I set up hair sculpture in the middle of space and connected it to my ear. So my body entered a meditative state while lying still on the floor for 10 hours in silence. So I compressed the 10 hours of performance to play for 1 minute 30 seconds, so you can see the light changing within the space very quickly. This is also an excerpt.
This is a video still image, Emptying the Mind. The videos become ritualistic meditation ceremonies. My head is shaved as monks do, representing a symbolic non-attachment to the material world. Also, I meditate with my back to the camera, um, embodying a detachment from my gender and culture and thought. Also, I am interested in exploring the teachings of Christianity, Buddhism, and Taoism. So I made a crown of thorn out of human hair that represents impurity of mind, which causes our pain. So in the video, I show the process of enduring and letting go as a way to purif purify the mind. So this is an excerpt from the end of the video. Also, I was inspired by the idea that life is nothing more than a dream, often found in Buddhist and Taoist thought. The skull, made from my hair, um, is potent symbol of life and death, which became the subject of the video. This is also an excerpt. I also make standalone hair sculptures. The weightless hair sculptures move from the air flow created by people's movements or from the environment. So those small movements on an intricate scale shift viewers' awareness towards subtle perception. Web of Life is a nine foot in di diameter, diameter sculpture installation made out of my own and my family members hair. So the web is an intimate meditation of the interconnectedness of life and harmony. This is Sensing Thought number five. Um, I was envisioning thought cloud and fragments of memories. And then I thought about our memories. Our memories constantly change and shaped by our perception. And our perceptions are changed by our memories again. So I made a series of woven hair structure that directly engage our perception. So this is a video documentation. Every angle at which you view the sculpture shows different interior composition. So it reveals that our perception cannot be by itself, but rather everything is constantly changing and interrelated. This is a Klein bottle. The Klein bottle is an example of non-oriental wall surface, like Mobius strip. 
So both are a surface that blurs the distinction between inner and outer. So I made the climb bottle stemming from the idea that our thoughts create our reality. Everything we perceive in the physical world has its origin in the inner world of our thoughts and beliefs. Thank you. Jia Moon considers herself to be a cartographer of cultures and her work is a kaleidoscopic investigation of the interplay between East and West and High and Low. Originally from Korea, she now lives and works in Atlanta. She's had one artist exhibitions in a wide range of institutions around the country, including the Museum of Contemporary Art in Georgia, the Mint Museum of Art, and the James Gallery at CUNY Graduate Center in New York. Her work is in the permanent collections of the Hirshhorn, the Asia Society, the High Museum, and the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, among others. And in 2011, she was the recipient of the prestigious Joan Mitchell, Award, Joan Mitchell Foundation Award. Her mid-career survey exhibition, Double Welcome, Most Everyone's Mad Here, is currently on a cross-country museum tour, including to DC's own Katzen Museum at American University, where it just closed. everybody. <laughs> um, I'm very happy to be here and I was in the, uh, sitting in the audience seat and I was just so inspired by the other three artists work and I totally forgot about my uh, my, <laughs> my, my turn came now. Um, I um, have to finish within eight minutes and I've never done this short presentation and I often really talk like really in the loop so I thought that in order to um, not miss anything, it might be better to read my artist statement. It's really short, so I'm gonna read it here. Um, why people love foreign stuff so much? When we travel to other countries, explore different cultures, and meet with new people, we tend to fall in love with things that are not our own. People have a soft spot for foreign things, I feel that it is because we add our own experience and Im imagination to the unfamiliar, which can lead us to misunderstanding it. It is, like a lot, it is a lot like tourism. As a foreigner living in the state, I often think, of, think about what authenticity really means, and I think we often mis misunderstand it. My recent work on paper, ceramic sculpture, ceramic installation with low tables explore the idea of something foreign. What I make might appear foreign and exotic, or it might look familiar or comforting, but you have to look carefully to understand what you're really experiencing. Ultimately, everyone except ourselves is foreign. Examining misunderstanding is part of the necessary process of understanding others. I want to share that experience. So I think my uh, artist statement says a lot about what I'm trying to say throughout the talk. So I brought 25 slides, and uh, I'm gonna flip through kind of quickly, but you can see the bottom about material and size and everything. Uh, I start out as a painter, and um, I used to be very figurative painter, and um, I got really traditional um, training in Korea. After I came to United States, I look at myself again uh, because other people ask me where I'm from. So I think that question kind of start out there and I, 
uh, change my medium and my material after I graduate from school because I really didn't have um, big space big, with the big window. Uh, I could not make oil painting. I think that's where I find uh, the material really speak to me, which is uh, work on paper. And sometimes I uh, mounted a uh, paper on canvases. Uh, other times I use uh, loose hanji paper. And um, my ground is paper, but uh, my medium is acrylic. Um, so water-based media, and which is American invention. I really think that it's really a good marriage between uh, acrylic painting, acrylic medium, and um, paper, often hanji paper that I bring from uh, my country. Um, I sometimes uh, talk about the, how material kind of speak um, is important because it support my concept. And this painting, um, as you see, uh, it's really complex and layered and there's a lot of um, um, symbols you see. Um, I'm not gonna go around and talk about that, but um, And this is kind of a combination of Hanji uh, Korean fan painting I got inspired by. Uh, by. Um, when I uh, put little fans um, all together, it's also kind of navigating through um, something more personal to something more universal. Uh, I often think about how you use social media, like you look at the Facebook, you're thinking about what your mom is doing at home, at the same time you're watching CNN news and um, watching there's a war out there. So I um, was thinking a lot about that and I was, um, is this working? Yeah, so like individual work and then all together the, the imagery kind of goes back and forth. And uh, you'll see the imagery that you kind of recognize and angry birds and and I often use these um, uh, elements like like uh, emoticon in a way. So you kind of see the, um, sort of snarky, smiley, um, you, you know, faces around. And this painting, I collaborate with my grandma, and my grandma helped me to uh, build these uh, borders with um, Korean fabric. So. It's a painting is a medium size, but if you look at it kind of like an object, like you know, it's resembled to Korean blanket. And I also find out a lot of like Hispanic people really enjoy my work because I guess our color scheme is kind of similar. And I saw them like in art fair, they take a picture in front of my painting and they really love uh, the elements like in my work. And I sort of like uh, observe that and then sort of give it back more to my work. And then uh, sometimes Korean people are like, oh, these are Korean elements, and I have to go tell them, um, actually, these elements came from like, uh, like Mexican like embroidery. And this actually also is in English. It says, bless your heart. It's a southern expression. I think a lot of people know what it means. But it kind of goes both ways. You know, if you say it sincerely, bless your heart, but it could also mean like, you know, you're stupid. Uh, so I, my work in a way also kind of play with the duality. Um, um, yeah. And here, I also play with the color. I changed the color here. This is a big chop mark. Oh, where's the red? So it's kind of supposed to look like Asian chop mark, but once I switch the color from red to blue, people hardly recognize what's going on. And I really like that. Um, it also kind of remind me of like, you look at those bright orchids like in a grocery store, they're come blue color and those blue orchids are not natural. So I play with that idea of like switching the color, um, you know, that people cannot identify things really quickly. And I'm, Making objects to, unlike Chaeyoung, my work is, I, uh, my process in the studio is, uh, I wouldn't say, I guess in a way meditative, but um, not so medita meditative. In, in a way, I, um, I guess I'm more of um, using hair as um, whimsical elements. 
Um, so I have assistant uh, make this really long rope, and then we sort of look at lots of YouTube video and then taught ourselves how to do hand knotted elements based on Korean accessory. So uh, part that you see over, where is the red? Yeah, that's a ginger knot. And then the ceramic elements is still painting and drawing. And then uh, the reason why I use hair is because everybody has hair and they're born with it. And that's part of their identity. And the textures different, colors different. Also, as you get older, you understand fashion and culture and you sort of have your hair in your own way. And in the contemporary time, people have like blue hair, like pink hair, which is not really natural color. But it also speaks like the current time and where the fashion and the younger generation. And so the identity is something you're born with, but also you can kind of play with these days and you can change it. So when I use uh, those, uh, by the way, these are ex uh, all those uh, fake hair that I got from Amazon.com or the store that I went into and bought as like, almost like fiber, bundle of fiber, and then we sort of use it and build things. So um, I know hair is like really beautiful when you have it, and then when it's out, it's kind of grotesque and it's really utterly like objects, weird and strange. And I wanted to sort of use that. I don't mind my work look a little bit sinister. I kind of like that, as my mom is Catholic, but she goes see fortune tellers sometimes, and I tell her that like that's wrong for your God, but she said it's okay. <laughs> and I also like really interested in the human behavior, like you know belief system in a way. So I made a bunch of them, and I titled them with the people that I know, or the figure that I knew from like children's movie or books. Um, so so you feel like when you see these pieces, you feel like you met somebody that look really familiar or friendly and you feel like oh, you can tell like where they're from and what they're into. So um, make a lot of them, you can kind of see the detail. And then after that I made, a, I got sick of hand knotted elements, it was so difficult, so I made a larger masks series. And then this actually based on African mask and I switched the medium. Look, I use earthen, white earthenware and then the inside of drawing is Korean, based on Korean folk art and my own doodle. And then as you can see the fortune cookies on the top. Um, you know fortune cookies are another misunderstanding elements <laughs> because oftentimes people think like it's from China but mainland China nobody knows what they are. Um, and then even after I ex explain all of this and so, uh, like the reception at my opening, someone came and asked me, but you're Korean, why are you using fortune cooking, that Chinese thing? And I was like, okay. And <laughs> it was really funny. For me, it's a fortune cookie, it's American thing. It's from San Francisco area. Um, yeah, right. I, and it gives me another reason to do this more. And then I made a pot. And uh, ceramic is like the, my uh, later like love. I call my painting my husband. Ceramic is my boyfriend. <laughs> so I can kind of go back and forth. And I really love and I have no, not too high expectation. And I'm not too picky with. <laughs> so I explore a lot <laughs> with ceramic. But here again, I draw and paint on the surface of ceramic pieces. And it's the same gesture of making painting on paper. And since when we uh, ignore craft, like craft is something really like in a separate department. Painting is always so cocky on a white wall. And you know, I just kind of wanted to go back and forth and tease that boundary. Flying yellow, so you can see the fortune cookie now acting like a you know, wing. And this is my, one of my latest work. And then when they, I put them all together, they were almost kind of like an um, army of all kinds of different people standing up. And I really like that. And then low table installation, it's funny because um, it ultimately, it's not really tr Korean traditional way, but people really want to believe it that way. And also for me, um, 
how can I say, instead of using pedestal, you use like a lower table, you, you just kind of move your body to lower it, to look at it. So all of a sudden you feel like you are the tallest person. So you have a little like loss in translation moment and you have to kind of go around and look at it. And then I had a show, this is the picture from my traveling show. And then I'll show you something really funny. So uh, this was one of the little group show that I was in. Um, so that was the setting. And this is in Photoshop. They had a Japan feast, and then the uh, people came and then sat there. And oh. they thought that they were invited and sat on the, and then the director sent me this uh, picture and I was actually really excited. I was like, that's really, really cool. <laughs> and I'm gonna include that picture for my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. That was, that was so interesting. <laughs> I enjoyed all of those, uh, those talks so much. Um, and um, Jiha, I appreciated you reading from your artist statement, and I am going to quote again from uh, the text that accompanied your recent exhibition. Um, so you, you wrote something that really interested me. You wrote, the world is so interconnected nowadays, how can one even tell where some someone or something comes from anymore? The seemingly simple question, where are you from, can be tricky to answer these days. So that is a question uh, that I would like to pose to all of you. Um, actually, a couple, of, a couple of related questions. How would, you know, how do you answer that question? Where are you from and, and does it matter? And do, would you have a different answer for yourself and for your art? And, and is that different somehow? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, I think it's a really interesting question because uh, we are here as um, Korean artists and in order to support Dohoso's work and it's kind of common. Um, but whenever someone asks me where are you from, I just quickly in my mind going through a lot of things and the, what should I say first. I used to answer really long, but now I'm whoever asks me now, and I kind of look at that person and trying to give back to what they want to hear. So, um, yeah, so like, often I could guess like, you know, oh yeah, I'm from South Korea. No, 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 but no, where you live now? Like, oh yeah, I, I live in Atlanta. So it really depends, but I think that everybody has really um, layered identity in a way, like not everybody is from one place, born there and die there. So they move around a lot. So, um, but I don't know, it's like, uh, not just for the artists, but it's just really, uh, I, I mean, question for everybody, I think. I, I also have the same experience, you know, many people ask me, you know, where are you from? I, all of a sudden, Virginia. Virginia is the first place I settled down. And no, 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 I'm New Jersey. No, 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 I'm Korea, something like that. So, you know, sometimes I'm confused where I, uh, am I fr from. And then, do I need that really, you know, do I, why do I have to answer the question? Because 
why it is so important where I am from and then I, what do I have to really answer? So, you know, the kind of the, um, the confused with the identity, that's the, you know, the status of my identity. That's what I feel. Mm -hmm. well, don't you think that when people ask, like, you know, for, for us, we are Korean, so yeah. we know, like, you know, but when the people, like for a lot of, in a lot of cases, like, you know, Sarah's foreigner to me, so when the uh, people ask me, where are you from, they want to know our nationality. That's how I understand, like, mm -hmm. whether you're Korean or Japanese or Chinese. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, they want, they want their answer to be correct. Mm -hmm. like, I'm guessing, but you tell me first, and oh yeah, I got it. I knew that you're Korean, but but it's really kind of interesting because I get Chinese a lot too, and um, Japanese a lot too. I get Chinese. <laughs> I I hardly get Japanese, but sometimes I get that too. But I think that's what they're curious. But do you think that that beyond the curiosity? I mean, do you think that there is um, is there a sense in which you're, you know? where you grew up, the traditions that, that you are familiar with that are, you know, not necessarily American traditions, are they important to the way you make work? Um, are, they tradition, are they important to the way you think about your art? And is that, is that you know, do you consider the, the place, you know, wh wherever you consider you being from, you know, all of those elements sort of enter into your, into your identity? I guess um, when people ask where are you from, they also want to know. Um, I think the identity um, may be defined by where we grow up because our childhood really like affects on our personality or the way of thinking. So even same Korean, like I noticed that your daughter born in here, but you, your daughter said um, she like aware of she's Korean American. But some um, children, like you know, child who adopted um, here from Korea, they don't say they are Korean American. Sometimes they say they are just American. So it's depending on when you move to um, you know America and how you move to America. It's all like you know, kind of different like elements like define like you know how they feel like you know is. Korean American or American or Korean. Like I moved to America like in the late twenties. Um, I feel I'm totally Korean. Like even though I will live here for after like forty years or fifty years, I will feel I'll still will be a Korean. <laughs> so that's the difference. Yeah. Yeah, I um, I'm comfortable saying that I, I'm Korean as well, but as an artist, I want to view as just an artist, and I, uh, my work is about universal theme, so, and art is a universal language, so I think as an artist, it's more important to not just narrow down into cultures, but more open to the visual language. It's something that's interesting. Um, I agree. I don't know if I agree. I think I agree sometimes that art is a universal language. <laughs> I don't know if I agree all the time. But I think that there is something um, about a lot of art that's successful that um, is based in the idea of um, discomfort and, and misunderstanding. And I think a lot of you play play with that idea of misunderstanding in, in your work and especially, you know, you approach one thing and you expect, have expectations and then those expectations are subverted. Um, and I, 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 you know, I, I'm wondering if, if any of you think that, you know, this idea of kind of sometimes living in translation or living, you know, between cultures kind of adds to that element of, um, um, une productive unease, you know, and productive misunderstanding that, that, that generates meaning. I think that uh, expect expectation from the viewer, like, is knowing that I'm Korean, and they, sometimes I find that, like, they want it more, like, traditional meaning. And I often, in my work, tease that, like, you know, I, I'll give you back, but I'll twist it and change it. So, like, what you understand as 
categorize it as Asian exoticism is not actually really exotic. It lives in your head. For example, like if you use color black, like people imagine calligraphy. Like, you know, oh, you're Asian, so you know how to do calligraphy. No, I just kind of look at it, sort of imitate it, but it's, no. But then sometimes I find that people were disappointed. Like, just like you, I'm looking at my own culture, like I wasn't really into when I was within that community. After I removed, it became more um, important because people reminding me all the time, oh, you're Korean, you're doing this, and you probably know about this. And then, Oftentimes, people see me like going like this, and nobody does that in Korea. Like it's, I think it's a <laughs> Taiwan Buddhism thing, and like I go with them like that too. Like you know, <laughs> but it's just like kind of give their expectation. But like I, it's so much better to be that way and build up rather than get upset. And um, like a, like fortune cookie, it's not a Chinese thing. But people are like, why are you using? Just they thought that it's Chinese thing. Oh, it's just I, I'll take it and I'll twist it. I'll edit more because it's a lot about misunderstanding. And I, like I said, like misunderstanding is like you're interested enough to misunderstand. Um, so I think that's an entry point to understand some culture and somebody different. I think that's really interesting. So. Um, yeah, I mean, like her, uh, Jayan, like I came here when I was 26. I was already full grown up speaking, like Korean is my mother language. It's like so different. But um, I think that after you said like 40, 30 years, like, you know, you think you still gonna be Korean? I'm not sure. Like I lived here like for a long time since 1999. And I think here I'm really Korean. When I go back, I get criticized a lot, like, you know, how Americanized I am. Like, my mother, like, everybody, in a way. So it's kind of like the thought, the idea is in between. Mm -hmm. When I think of myself as really Korean, that makes me more Korean. And when I go there, I'm more, like, sort of, like, representing America, in a way. <laughs> Then I come here, I'm like super more Korean. <laughs> so it's, it's like, a, like unsettling, like kind of like a crazy purgatory. <laughs> so a, a productive purgatory. <laughs> Yeah, also I think, you know, the, the Koreanness, Koreanness, you know, when people the, in Korea see the Koreanness is different from the Koreanness in here. So, you know, because of the, you know, many hybrid this gym happen, because, you know, it reflected a lot of, you know, local factors. And then even, you know, some, um, because sometimes it's kind of the uh, mutated by the you know intentionally, so for you know economic reason or you know many reasons. So the kind of the things originality of something is kind of different, even though it rooted from the same place. Mm -hmm. So Koreanness kind of things here when they see it from the Korea, it's foreignness kind of thing. It's interesting interesting to hear from her um, story like I also you reminds me the experience I also whenever I go back to Korea um, I ch like since like because I've lived here for over 10 years my perspective changes and I see the Korea still has a very strong influence from Confucianism expecting elders and also humility so I remember in art school in Korea um, I didn't have experience of critics. I had to listen to the professor's um, opinions. Uh, it was one way, like kind of uh, education. Um, but when I came to USA, I realized uh, in critic, people's opinions is one of many. So um, my art changes from hearing all different perspectives. So now I feel more comparable, uh, those kind of like uh, horizontal, like in a relationship, one-on-one -on -one horizontal relationship uh, versus vertical like relationship. So those things like kind of changed. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah, but the Confucianism came from China too, right? So it's yeah. like, it's not, a, so it's all, <laughs> I think it's all, all kind of it's right? all, yeah. Um, uh, just you talking about humility. I'm just uh, a question about your your work. Um, it's it's so powerful. 
Um, and you know, the, the images, the sculptures themselves are so powerful, the videos. And, and, I, and I kept thinking about the afterlife of, of you as a person also kind of going through the world after you, after you make these sculptures and, and, and you're shorn. I mean, it's so interesting thinking about, you know, both of you using hair and the, the different, um, um, all the symbolism of hair and, and all the meaning that hair carries and uh, cultural meaning and, and sexuality and organicism and pride and, and then when you don't have it, the, the kind of the purity but also the kind of shame that, there, that is signified by that. And, and is that part of your performance, the, the way you go through the world after, after, after you shave your head? So your question is... <laughs> <laughs> the, my question is just, is that part of your work, your, uh, your, the okay. afterlife? Of yeah, um, I think like, you maybe touch upon like, the materiality and also the body, like engage into my art. Uh, it's both from my childhood uh, memories. Uh, my mom is a therapist and a Korean traditional dancer. She often performs for Korean couple women who forced into sexual slavery by the Imperial Japanese Army during World War II. So I grew up watching her dance and seeing the audience's tears and laughter. So it made me understand that the bodily practice of ritual might heal the failures of language and logic. So I started to think of a body as a tool for cleansing memory, not just so only personal memory, but collective me memory through the physicality of the present. present. Uh, but in terms of female body, I don't want to talk, I mean, I don't want to, I don't have an intent to represent just only female body. That's why I cut off my hair and, um, and also don't wear any clothing. So my androgynous appearance um, can represent a human being. Um, and also in terms of the hair material, like um, in, uh, in my mother's generations, um, the hand weaving and sewing was very common skill to have. After the Korean War, materials and resources were very limited, so self-sustainability -sustain was very crucial to survive. So my mom taught me the craft of hand weaving and also making simple winter sweaters and scarves. So the thread was my aesthetic consciousness. I think that's why like all of our works in a way related to um, thread and also um, kind of very sophisticated, I think. Um, so I used to use uh, like thread to make the installation, uh, kind of metaphorical liminal space between uh, physical pain and um, spiritual growth. Um, but then I, um, as my body was taking a prime, primary role in my like, process of art making, I was looking for a material that can represent both body and mind. I think human hair is um, kind of have that kind of aspect. Yeah. Um, and and um, I, I want to open it up to the audience in, in a little bit, but I, um, something um, Taiwa and Nara, both of you, um, I could be wrong, but both of you were talking about um, your uh, representation of the landscape mm -hmm. um, and this kind of dichotomy and, and play between um, the natural landscape and the artificial landscape. And you both um, related it to um, also your understanding of the American landscape and your, um, and the Korean landscape and your memories of the Korean landscape. And I'm just wondering if you could say a bit more about that and unpack that a little bit more. Um, actually, if you think about the Korean landscape, you would think about the very small, you know, the very you know, beautiful hills and trees. But to me, the Korean landscape is the concrete apartment. Yeah, we are living in the very same construction, construct buildings, you know, in Korea, in Seoul, especially if you are raised in Korea, we are, you know, worrying about the, you know, not the, you know, how different we are from the other people. We always think about how similar we are. 
and then the landscape. So you know that's a reason I'm kind of interested in the you know the hybrid and then the transplants and then you know cement and the concretes and then relationship with the human nature and the more eco um, ecosystem kind of things. Maybe that's reason I'm making those you know artificial kind of imaginary landscape and then. For me, the landscape is not just the you know the landscape. Also, it's the portrait. So, and then it's the more you know not just showing the lands, and then it just it's more the place that I'm telling my story about you know my senses or my bodies or my relationships other objects. So, yeah. In Korea, a lot of people use synthetic materials. Um, to cover furniture or um, domestic spaces and also in hotels and um, in intimate spaces. So when I visit my family, I go to um, interior design district in Korea and explore new materials. And then when I, when I go to the Home Depot, I still see similar similarities between um, Korean culture and what is happening here. A lot of people use synthetic materials for houses in like suburban area. And I thought that was very interesting because I thought it was only my culture when I was growing up. And when I came to the US, I thought that similarity was interesting. So I started to pay attention to that and eventually use it for my work. Um, uh, and, and just one last question um, before I open it up. Um, so many, most of you or all of you are, are thinking about um, this idea that you're talking about of, of memory and, and history and how to represent, um, how to represent culture, how to represent the past, how to represent you know your personal, um, your personal stories and, 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 and your family. Um, in, in this, this, you know, this idea of memory kind of carrying through um, to the present, and I guess you know, I, I'm just an open-ended question about how you see your work, um, you know, f going forward and, and fitting in um, to the to the world now. Um, I um, I think being and Korean carrying lots of painful memory, at least I think my generation, um, because of painful memories of Japan's 35 years occupation, as well as, well as the Korean War, and the subsequent division of the country bit, uh, into North and South Korea. Um, and also the kind of, um, the rule by oppressive re uh, military regime for decades. So I remember my grandfather was a teacher um, in an elementary school uh, during the Japanese occupation. And then he told me he went to jail and tortured by Korean soldiers only because he taught Korean history to young students. And he was lost touch with his family who may or may not live in uh, North Korea. Um, and uh, also I heard many stories from my parents' generations about um, like democratic movements against the Kore Korean military um, the government. So um, like even I remember like I had to run back home because the military police used toxic tear gas against the, uh, like the protesters, student protester. So these all like direct and indirect experience um, informed my understanding of human condition. Um, so I, um, I think, um, and then like, you know, I have to search the process of suffering and then like a cleansing memory and like ultimately move toward healing. It all integrate into my art. Um, I think, um, like many problems in this uh, century, like you know, com the 
all the conflict comes from um, like you know different belief system, like such as ideology and politics and organized religions. And I strongly believe that if people saw the reality as it is without their prejudice, like most of man-made conflict would have never occurred. So I think my performance, like in nature, is, is like kind of composed by like long durational performance and cleansing the memory. Um, and I have found that many, many meditation practices offer the powerful method, um, kind of um, powerful method, like for like cleansing the memory and try to sing the nature as it is. Um, so I hope my performance kind of can bridge between like ancient wisdom and the modern issues to facilitate uh, psychological healing through the uh, art experience. And that's my direction. I don't know how to follow up. <laughs> 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 um, am I talking? <laughs> I, guess, I guess for me, um, Memory, I guess, if I talk about memory in my work, it's, uh, I guess it's, I can relate it to more a personal imagery. Like, I'm not really making work for, like, certain audience, my, just thinking that my audience, everybody, and um, how to make it more personal, and then it become more universal, and then sort of going back and forth. So from a distance, it's a big landscape. Like I talked about, like you're watching CNN news, and you know all the conflict and what we are going through is happening. But at the same time, you're talking with your husband, you're talking with your mother. Mm -hmm. So it's personal versus very universal. That's both really important. And I really want my work to do the same. So from a distance, it's really abstract and multi-layered, lots of different colors. Um, but up closer, there's a lot of like intimate moment. And then color relationship also uh, represents certain culture or a certain uh, generation, generational trend. And that sort of uh, circulate and then uh, bring up more uh, bigger conversation. Uh, I think even though it's the personal experience, it kind of reflected uh, our social problems or you know, cultures. And then you know, the, some community share the, that uh, a certain culture more, some you know, group of people you know, the, maybe less understand my memories and personal memories. So I think you know, the important thing, um, how we share the, that empathy. You know, the, through the you know our personal memory, how we you know make a sense of the you know the connected. So you know, some group of the people because we share the we can really share that memory together, and then there's a something you know uh, culture we can share together. We remember together. That's a reason you know the certain group you know I can appeal more or appeal less. So. Yeah, so the important thing is kind of the sense of connection, I think. And my earlier works deal more with physical, physicality, physical sculptures. And as I show the guest book installation, it, more, it deals more with about history, memory, and what really remains is invisible, intangible. So. Starting from my own memories, I think I want to explore more about um, how to visualize memories, whether it's personal or whether it's something that other people can relate to. So I think it's, it's gonna be interesting for my next body of work, so. <laughs> Thank That's you. All. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple of questions from the audience. If, if you could raise your hand so we can bring the mic to you since this is being recorded. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, my name is Young Cheng. I'm a Korean American just like you. I'm so impressed about uh, your presentation tonight. 
I'm not an artist. I'm an architect. So we have a common uh, artistic area to how you come up with all your idea, to share all your thought, your, your presentation to all the audience. I'm so impressed about your generation. I'm of a different generation as you are, but I, I'd like to encourage you a few items for what I felt as an architect to see you as an artist. So what I see here is all over you express your each project, emotional level, physical level, and the, the presentation is wonderful. I love every individual your presentation. And I like, but I like to see when you're presenting your each uh, art, object, whatever, I want to see some more clear concept where the concept originating to express your thought deeply to the audience, then uh, audience will be more appreciative about your work. And so we can see your originality of the, your work is a fantastic. But I'd like to add more. Where this all using the material, how you express, this is uh, also we need to learn from you, your thought your talent. So that's my thought. Thank you. It's a tough order in, in eight minutes. <laughs> Should I say something? <laughs> I think that's really a um, good point and also very uh, difficult question. Uh, for me, oftentimes, uh, there is a uh, boundary that how much I expose um, and how much I want to hide. I don't want to expose everything and make my work look like illustration of something, illustration of an idea. That's a terrible uh, way to make work for me. Um, and as an artist, we have a task to do things, our priority, what is our priority. I think a lot of artists have a studio practice and they have their own priority in terms of process and concept. And also there is a um, responsibility for the audience as well. I think that audience has to uh, come and look at the work more carefully. These days like everything is so bombastic, everything is so entertaining and people's expansion span is so short. And to, as a 2D person, it's really hard to please. That's why I call painting is cocky boyfriend. <laughs> um, you know, you have to research. You have to look at work over and over again. And you have to look at the title. You have to try to understand uh, artist's mind. And sometimes, for me, experience is most important thing. As an artist myself, I don't quite understand sometimes most of artists' work. And I'm okay with that because it's not something for me to understand quickly. It's a good, good work. Uh, it gives me question. It makes me doubt. It makes me come back to it over and over again. And I have a relationship with the work. And that's the work that's something for me. It's more alive. And uh, Philip Custom says something, make something alive, you know. So, like, you know, we are, I think, for, at least for me, my idea is not to. Uh, uh, illustrate my I concept as an idea. I want to make it as complicated, as naughty as possible to confuse audience. I'm because I'm naughty person. <laughs> <laughs> this will actually be our last question because we're running out of time. But you are welcome to join us in the lobby for the reception and talk to the artists more then. Hi, my name is Christine, and I'm so thrilled that you guys are here. Um, and thank you, Sarah, for putting this together. Uh, I was wondering which of the artists, I know Nara doesn't have any children, but do any of you guys have children? OK, so this question is for you. How old is your daughter? 16 years and 12, do 12 years. Oh, great. So would you consider yourself a 1.5 generation? Or a point five generation, uh, Korean. For me, yeah, yeah, no, no. <laughs> so you would consider yourself like straight Korean. 
Yeah, I think okay. so. Mm -hmm. Well, I was just very curious to know, like, if you were a 0.5 generation Korean American, would you have the same sort of cultural misunderstandings and dialogues with your children as mm -hmm. I have with my mom? Mm. Whereas, like, I'm first generation and she's, you know, totally Korean. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was just, I just want to know. Yeah, I, I don't know, you know, it's gonna be answered or not, but, you know, uh, my daughter using the chopstick very wrong way when we see the you know her chopstick using, and then you know the whenever I go to the Korea, my mom, she has to correct that chopstick using you know way. So, but you know, why it's so important? You know that it's her thing. You know that she used the you know chopstick as a fork way, and then she using the chopstick eating salad. So, yeah, that's uh, her generation, and then that's that's she. Yeah, that really reflected uh, you know her. Identity, I think. Well, I, I'll add a little more. I have a almost ten-year-old son, and he's half. Amer I mean, he's American. Let, let's get it straight. He's American, but he's half Caucasian, half Korean. Um, so he's often asked all these questions, and I try to teach Korean as much as possible. But it's really hard. But it's not just a nat uh, nationality thing, but also it's a generational thing too. So like older people and, and then uh, younger millennials and then even go like lower, they have their own culture. And it's like both way effort. Like you can't really just lecture somebody. Korean people say konde. Like if you're just lecturing the younger generation, you have to do it, follow this way, traditional way, only this way, you become konde. You have to try to understand their culture and it requires patience. And it's really, really hard. Um, so I think that we're going through a lot, but it's really also challenging, but I think that it's a, also a beautiful thing that we uh, come from a different way, but trying to find a middle ground and then try to understand each other. And then like oh, what uh, Tehwa said, like, you know, Chapstick, she's using the wrong way, but she's, she let her use that way, but that's okay, that's just acceptable. Like, I'm kind of with you, like, why not? Right? It's better than not learn how to do it at all or not knowing what it is. So I think it's um, like we have to understand and support. Thank you again. Thank you.